Hey there, pen world. Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it is episode number 267 of Goulet Q&A. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, nib warranties, the pen that got away, and the coolest inks in a demonstrator pen, among other things. Uh, it's actually been kind of a, I don't know, boring week for me on the personal front. We've been just getting the kids back into the school routine, cleaning the house, doing some just kind of very routine family stuff little fixing things here and there, going to the dump, you know, nothing too crazy. Uh, but we have some, had some more exciting things going on here at Goulet Pens, specifically some new pens that we've been waiting for that I like pulled a few of these and I was like, oh my gosh, I kind of have a few to show you, especially some really nice stuff. So we had a good mix of some, uh, some interesting Lamy stuff. We had some other new things. So uh, let me tell you what's been going on. So uh, one thing that we did get in was the um, Conklin Duraflex Endless Summer. So this is a new color of Duraflex. Has the, you know, I've talked the last couple weeks in Q&A about new Conklin nibs. I use in heavy quotations. Um, so because this is a, a new model, um, you can anticipate these are gonna have the newest, latest, greatest version of these Conklin OmniFlex nibs, which are going to uh, be some of the best performing OmniFlex nibs they've ever produced. So these are numbered limited editions, rose gold trim in this purple and orange and yellow kind of swirl. Pretty interesting looking pen, uh, but uh, you can check those out. We've got those available now. Um, the Pilot has come out with a couple of things. These are things that have been made in Japan, but they are new to us here in the US. Uh, the first thing is the Pilot uh, Ishime. And these are some very interesting Yurushi pens. I'm trying to pick which one is gonna show it off the best. Um, I think maybe the burgundy will. Um, there's a burgundy, black, navy blue, and a green. And I've got three of them to show you here today. So let's start off. This is the burgundy. You can see very subtly there's a pattern to it. And it's kind of like this crosshatch kind of pattern. It's very subtle. It has a texture to it. Um, but if you catch it right in the light, you can really see it um, kind of play out. Where is it? There we go. So um, this is uh, the Yukari style. It's the flat top. It's going to be a brass barrel, so it's got a little bit of weight to it, um, and it's going to have a gold nib on it, which has the, I forgot which version of it, it is the 18 karat gold nib. Really nice, and for what it is, for Yurushi with a pattern like this, you know, granted it's not, uh, you know, this like, themed kind of heavily macchiated thing like you would have on some of the higher end Namiki pens. Um, but for a pilot with Yurushi work like this, um, relatively reasonable price in the $700 range. Um, so here's, uh, here's the burgundy, there's a black, a navy, and uh, there's also a dark green. So these are all kind of similar patterns on them, uh, but some different colors. They all have black grips, and uh, the tops of them are all smooth, which I think is kind of classy and they all say Yurushi Japan on the bottom. So very nice looking pens. They come in, uh, you know, this box that looks kind of like this. Um, no, that's wrong, that's the wrong box. It comes in a box that looks like this. The other box is for the next pilot I'm gonna show you. So it's got kind of a, a similar kind of, um, you know, not as heavy as of a texture, but kind of emulates a little bit uh, the, the texture on the pen. It comes in a wooden box like you see on some of the nicer Namiki pens um, with some Pilot swag inside. Uh, nothing too crazy going on in here, but they come with, uh, which converter does it come with? I haven't actually opened this pen up, let me see. These are gonna be really great writing pens. It's the same nib size as what you would have on like a Pilot Custom 74, I believe. Actually, I need to check that. Con 70 converter, so that's a plus. Um, yeah, actually, I need to verify that nib size thing. Don't hold me to that. To my eye, I can't tell if it's more of a custom 823 size or custom 74 size. I gotta verify that, but mm, dang, I just can't tell. They're so close. Uh, but anyway, really nice. Nice looking pilot pens. Glad to see them bringing some more stuff into the US. And I now have a lot of things that I need to deal with here at my desk. I'm gonna gently put this stuff aside and set it over here. There you go. Okay, that is that. Next one that I have is the Pilot Sterling Silvern. So um, they make several different variations of this. We have two of them. Um, so this is uh, Sterling Silver pens with 18 karat gold nibs. These, uh, there's two different versions we have. Uh, this one is called um, Sumuji, 
Samugi, sorry, uh, which literally translated means splinter, and it has a texture to it that looks a lot like, there you go, you can see that pattern up close. Um, it's meant to emulate the pattern of silk, so it has kind of this like, I don't know, silken weave kind of thing going on there? I don't know, it's just like these little, these little fibers? I don't know, it's really tough to describe, which is why I'm glad I can show you here. Um, but it's all sterling silver, so it is going to uh, polish up really beautifully like this. It'll tarnish a little bit, so having a polishing cloth will help tremendously. It does not include a polishing cloth with it, unfortunately. Um, but we sell, actually, nope, 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 nope. Sorry, didn't look deep enough in the box. They do include a polishing cloth, a little pilot two-tone cloth in there. The white on the inside of the cloth polishes up with a polishing compound, like you have with other jeweler's cloths, um, like we have with our Goulet. Uh, polishing cloth as well. It's got a little jewelry, jewelry care information there, some some warranty cards and other swag. Um, but anyway, really beautiful pen. So we have had before the um, Pilot Sterlings in, uh, we had a couple different ones. We had the Panda, we had um, the Komodo Dragon, uh, the regular Dragon. Uh, we brought it away because um, you know, they kind of were on the, that those particular designs were kind of on their way out, um, but these are new ones we're happy to have back. It's got this really cool inlaid nib, which we do not have a lot of pens that have inlaid nibs. Pilot E95S is one that I can think of that has it, um, but this is a different nib than that one. It writes really great, it's Pilot, so it's going to write really great. 18 karat nib, um, and you know, for what it is, I feel it's a it's a relatively reasonably priced pen. We don't have a lot of solid sterling silver pens, um, but this one at MSRP is 680, um, and we're going to have it for just around mid 500s on our site. Um, this is the other one. This is uh, a grid-like pattern. This is the the Koshi, and this is um, resembling the color of an old Japanese house. Uh, sorry, not the color, representing the pattern that you would have on an old Japanese uh, house door. So there you go, you can see this grid-like pattern. It's kind of a similar pattern to what you see in the Platinum Prime pen, if you're familiar with that one. Um, you know, they're both pulling from some of the same elements of what you would see in Japan, so not super surprising to see two Japanese companies with a grid-like pattern like this. Um, and again, this is gonna have that same inlaid nib on it, snap cap, very firm snap on it. Um, really beautiful pens, especially when they're all polished up and new looking. And they're going to be great writers, too. So if you're really into sterling silver, I would give this two a look. Uh, and then we have some new Lamy stuff, which we've been waiting for for a little bit, and I'm very excited to have them. Uh, and I pulled a bunch of other Lamy pens to show for comparison as well. Um, probably end up doing a right now on this, uh, but I thought I would at least show you preliminarily because I uh, kind of have a lot of Lamy's, so I thought I would show you some. Um, so one that I have here, this is the... Um, Lummy Scala Dark Violet Special Edition. The Dark Violet looks similar to some of the other purples and violets that they have done in other pens. Uh, for example, they have done a violet in the uh, Studio, which is just a little darker. I actually, I actually kind of dig the Scala Dark Violet just a little bit more because it's got a little more vibrancy to it. It's a little more pink, not quite as subtle uh, as, as this one. Uh, and then uh, to compare it also to the All-Star Purple. So the All-Star Purple is maybe even slightly more vibrant, uh, slightly more kind of pinkish in color. So you can see here, they didn't just take the exact same color and plaster it on another pen. It is slightly different, um, though, you know, somewhat similar. Um, so kind of somewhat in the middle of these two. It's gonna have a stainless steel nib on this one. Um, scale itself is not a like, super staple pen. It's a relatively newer pen from Lamy. It's got a metal grip section, a shiny metal grip section. Not everybody's crazy about it. It's a little more expensive than the rest of the uh, Lamy's, and it's got the same nib as an All-Star and Safari and stuff like that, so um, that is one thing that you should kind of be aware of that, but the nice thing is you can swap the nibs on and off and stuff like that. They do, sometimes they do limited edition versions or special edition versions that are gold nibs. Sometimes they're steel, um, but it's the same pen body. It's got a spring clip, so it's a very functional pen, and it's going to be a decent writer because, you know, you're getting a Lamy, um, you know, but it is just a little bit more in price there. 
Uh, another one that we have is the Lamy Studio Aqua Marine Special Edition. Now this one I really like. This is a really nice color. It's a very much of a blue-green, but I have a couple others that I wanted to show and compare to. Um, this was the Lamy Studio Racing Green that we had last year, so you can really see a comparison there. And then to show you, this is the Lamy All-Star Pacific to give you an idea of kind of where that aquamarine color falls in between those two. Really nice looking color if you're a fan of, you know, turquoises or blues or whatever. Um, this is gonna have a stainless steel nib, so it's gonna be, um, you know, around the same price as the um, racing green was. Really, I'm really happy with how that one turned out. Honestly, all the Lamy pens I'm gonna show you today, I'm quite happy with. Uh, another one that I've got here, this is a Lamy Studio. Um, this is another special edition, and uh, this is the Studio Lux Black. Okay, LX, LX or we, Lux as we call it, Black. Um, so this is a completely stealthed out version of the studio, which I don't know that they've ever done that before. So they essentially took the same black PVD coated uh, nib with that tiny little um, kind of laser accent that they have on the nib. So yeah, you can see these accents here on the nib. It's the same thing you're gonna see on the other Lux pens, uh, if you're familiar with those. It's got a similar grip to it, which, you know, if you don't like the shiny metal grip that you see on most other studios, uh, you know, which is like this, um, this violet one that I have here. So this is typically what you see on most of the other studios. This one is gonna have that same black, um, slightly textured grip. It's not really textured, it's like a matte finish um, of what's on the body of the pen. It feels really, really similar to that. Uh, and so it's gonna have a really good grip to it. In fact, I don't know if that's actually, I can't tell if that's rubber grip or if that's just metal that's coated in the same way here. It almost feels slightly different. I don't know, I don't know how to really tell that. Because I have a, a stainless steel uh, studio that has that kind of black rubber grip. It feels a lot like that. That might be what it is. I honestly can't distinguish it, but I'm gonna say that it's probably that black rubber and not just an anodized black metal. Um, but I could be wrong. So, uh, completely blacked out. Pretty cool, black nib, black trim here on the clip, on the cap. And, uh, you know, honestly, now that I look at it, it looks like they even blacked out the feed. Um, I'm trying to see if that's like truly a black feed. It looks like a black feed to me, uh, which is kind of interesting. I didn't know this, notice that until just now. So that feed, doesn't that look, doesn't that look blacker to you? I don't know. It's pretty interesting, but if you like blacked out pens, uh, and you normally like kind of the design of the studio, you just don't love that shiny metal grip, uh, give this Lux Black a look because I think it looks pretty freaking awesome. Uh, and then to just show you uh, kind of what it compares to or what it reminds me of, it reminds me a lot of the uh, Lummy Black All-Star. Uh, so very, very cool, very kind of stealthed out uh, on there. So gives you an idea of what it is. Super cool. And then the last one that I have is the uh, Lux Marone, which I'm also very excited about. Um, so this one, like the Lux, it comes in its own cool matching tube. This is another special edition, um, and it's kind of cool. It has that little popping sound. It actually comes packaged inside the tube. This is unique to the Lux, um, and is honestly part of the reason why it's a higher cost, is because of the packaging itself. But Lamy just loves this packaging, which is pretty rad, I can't blame him. Um, and so you get this whole package, which is great for gifting and stuff. Um, the pen itself is very, very similar in color to the Toffee All-Star. Uh, coffee all Toffee? Coffee? I can never remember which one it is. But there you go, I'm trying to get you close up. So it's, it's very similar. It's actually a little deeper, maybe a little richer in color which I actually like better. And then it's got this really cool trim like the Lux has, but the, the color, the complements it so well. Oh man, and then it's got the black nib on it as opposed to the silver nib that the Coffee All-Star had on it. Uh, you know, Lamy really nailed it with this one, honestly. I think, personally, I think it's worth a little bit higher price to get these accents that it has uh, with the tube and all that kind of stuff. It's really cool. So. I'm really excited because a lot of you 
uh, missed out on this All-Star a while ago. They are very hard to come by. Honestly, you're going to pay more for one of these used uh, than you would for a new uh, Lux. So I'm really, really happy with the revamp on that one. Uh, and very pleased now that I see it in person. Because, you know, sometimes these colors are very subtle, they're very difficult in photographs to understand how they look, but looking at all four of them together, it's like, dang, Lamy is uh, coming on strong with their color game this year. So really, really pleased to see the color selection that's come out here, and I have one of each of them now in my collection to add to my other mini Lamis. Um, okay, I promise you I will get to questions this week, but I just have so many other things to show you. Um, okay, we're going to wrap this up soon, though. Another pen that I have to show you that is going to be painful because it's even more expensive, um, but it's beautiful. Um, so Aurora, as part of their Cento 100-year celebration, um, has this pen that comes in this gargantuan box. Um, pretty sizely, but worth it for what you're getting. Um, so this is the Aurora Oceani. Uh, and this is a, a different model, different style of pen. Uh, and I'm just showing you the box right now because I'm going to lead up to the pen. So the box, you can take it out of this thing. You know, it's got like a felt bottom and everything, this matte finish on the box. Aurora definitely does a number with their boxes. Um, so here you go. It's got a nice little slot for the pen, limited edition, comes with a bottle of ink. It's a small bottle of black ink. It's nothing too crazy, um, but that is kind of a nice touch. And they've got a limited edition booklet that covers all the different limited edition things um, that they have done in recent years. So it's uh, it's quite a few. And then they number the booklet to match the pen too. So this is a limited, individually numbered limited edition pen. And let me show you this thing. So this is the Oceani, uh, Oceano. Pacifico, uh, which is this unbelievable looking turquoise color. So uh, on my monitor, it looks a little blue, but it's definitely a pretty hearty green. Uh, I'm trying to think of, well, what do I have handy here to show you? Um, so here's the Lamy um, Pacific. So it's, it's more green than that for sure. Um, here is the Lamy Studio Aquamarine, which is also a little bluer. This particular color is really tough to get right in photographs. On our website, as I hold it up and look at our website, it, um, it's very bright. So it looks a little darker in person as I'm holding it here. So I'll just give you forewarning on that. This is one of those materials that's going to shift color just a little bit, um, depending on how it's lit. But, oh my gosh, it looks, it looks unreal in person. Um, new model of pen, so it's got sterling accents, which you're going to need to polish. 18 karat nib. Um, which is, you know, got that silver coating on it as well. Some really nice kind of like hand carved, uh, you know, looking accents. Uh, I don't know whether they're actually hand carved or not, but it definitely looks like it is that way. And it's very possible given that it's sterling silver. Piston fill, um, it is going to have that metal grip. So not sure how much you love that, but honestly, this is a real stunner of a pen. I am... Uh, fighting hard not to pick one of those up. I don't know. I've been buying a lot of pens recently, and I'm, this is a pricey one. Um, that one's going to run you over $1,000, uh, but it's pretty pretty awesome. Um, so there's that one. There's the Indiana, which is a purple version of that, and the Atlantico, which is uh, blue. The blue one is yet to come, but the purple and the turquoise ones uh, we have now, as well as the uh, Aurora 88 Black Mamba Limited Edition. So Aurora's really been coming out with a bunch of them recently, so it's pretty great. They're doing just a slew of pens to celebrate their 100th anniversary, um, you know, and it's uh, it's pretty exciting to see them doing that. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that a lot of people are asking about, curious about, is the Pilot Vanishing Point Limited Edition 2019 Tropical Turquoise. Um, it's probably going to be next week before we had that. They uh, got a little messed up with uh, Hurricane Dorian. Uh, because they are um, Pilot USA is based out of Jacksonville, Florida. So they got shut down for several days. Everything's okay there. You know, it, if they had gotten a direct hit, it would have been bad. Um, they didn't, though. So um, it definitely, they sent everybody home because they were in an evacuation zone and all that kind of stuff. So um, anyway, got them set back. So sip and delayed a little bit, but very justifiably so. Cool. All right, let's get into some questions for this week, shall we? It's one of my longer intros for sure. Starting off with pen and writing questions. This is from Singh 2 k 19 on Twitter. Has the Twisby Eco cracking situation been resolved? 
Has it been resolved? All right, where is my eco? I had an eco, here it is. I have a clear eco. Uh, has the cracking situation been resolved? You know, honestly, I hear about uh, Twisby cracking kind of in waves, like it goes away for a while and then it kind of resurfaces. I think some of it has to do with people read old threads or like one person has a crack that, that occurs and then everybody else starts to research it and like seven year old threads from Fountain Pen Network kind of come up. Um, so I'll give you my perspective on it. Um, there's a lot of ecos out there and I rarely hear of a crack. Not to say that it can't happen, we do hear about it every so often. Um, most of the time it's like at the grip section. Um, the body is really, really sturdy, um, but it can happen at the grip or at the threads. Um, not to say it's, it's impossible. Really any pen can crack. Um, this one does. Um, it does it, but probably not as, any more than any other pen really. It's just one of those hot button things that like people can sometimes associate um, Twisby with cracking. And I'll give you the pers my perspective on that. So it wasn't really a widespread issue even to begin with, especially with the Eco. Um, it, it's come up a little bit on Goulet Nation and we've seen it here and there. Um, honestly, this was more of an issue back when Twisby first started out with the 530, the model 530 and the 540. It got a lot better, but it was still happening. Then they came out with the 580, they redesigned and um, it happened a little bit, but then largely um, they figured out what was causing it. And, and through those iterations of the redesigns, it wasn't so much an issue. I think what happened was people were just associating Twisby and cracking and it was, it all just got jumbled in and it just kind of had that reputation for a long time. And now of course, anytime there's ever an issue that can resurface. So, um, you know, my perspective is it's really not something that should dissuade you from getting one of these pens. Um, especially because really Twisby has stood behind their stuff and they make it right for like everybody. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, they've explained it to me before of like why these pens, especially in the earlier days, were more prone to cracking. Um, it's not really so much the design of the pen itself or the material that's used. It actually has to do, especially on the, on the diamond series ones, like the 580s and stuff. Um, you know, if you notice, they're, they're incredibly like polished and, and very scratch resistant. Um, it's because there's some sort of coating process that uses this very specific amount of heat to cure this, this stuff that makes it scratch resistant. Um, and I guess if you, if you do that process wrong, then um, the way that it cures and stuff like that can put stresses on the plastic that will make it um, more prone to crack. So, um, you know, part of that is like they're trying to do something really good for the pen that if they end up doing it wrong, uh, can actually be bad for the pen. So uh, given that and how very rarely uh, I hear about that these days, I would say really they've kind of figured it out. Um, but the potential is there, I guess. Um, and as with any pen, you know, if there's any type of, of issue like that, just with, with normal use, um, that would be a warranty issue that they would um, surely stand behind. So, you know, to Twisby's credit, they stand behind it well. It really hasn't been that much of an issue, um, and you can have a lot of confidence in buying, especially an Ego, these days. But, of course, we're always open to feedback. You can let us know. You can let Twisby know anytime that you might have an issue. Cool. All right, Christine D. on Facebook, when it comes to warranties on fountain pens, notice I place these back to back, uh, consumers are not warned, or sorry, consumers are warned not to swap nibs or you risk voiding the warranty. But when it comes to thoroughly cleaning this pen, sometimes a consumer has to remove the nib. Uh, does thorough cleaning risk voiding the warranty? Uh, okay, so this is good. I'm glad you asked this. Uh, the short answer is yes and no. Uh, it really depends on the manufacturer and it kind of depends on the situation. So warranties really are there to ensure that there has not been a manufacturing defect with the pen and that it will perform under normal use uh, without, without defecting, right? Um, I think some companies are... Uh, have different interpretations of what normal use is. Um, a lot of people would, would think, yeah, completely disassembling a part and putting it back together and scrubbing it with a toothbrush and all that kind of stuff is totally normal use and that's how it should be done. Uh, most manufacturers, you know, will have their own interpretation of what normal use is. It usually tends to fall within kind of a certain range of, of activities that, that pen people are doing. 
Um, but uh, you might think like, yeah, swapping a nib and putting out another pen, that's normal use. I do that every day. It's completely normal. And everybody else in my forum or my pen club or whatever does the same thing. Well, that's our perspective based on who we're kind of hanging out with, what's normal. Um, from the manufacturing standpoint, they're dealing with kind of everybody around the world. There might be different standards of how things are used. So they will often kind of put guidelines or parameters. Sometimes it's in like a little warranty booklet. Sometimes it's on their website. Sometimes it's assumed and they aren't as clear about it, which can get confusing. Um, but I think generally speaking, when you're talking about removing parts of the pen, that gets into a really gray area. Most pen companies, I would say most conservative pen companies would not necessarily assume that removing nibs and removing like piston mechanisms and, and various parts of the pen for the purpose of cleaning, they probably would not just default to considering that normal use. Now, I'm very practical. I take apart all my pens when I clean them, um, partly because I, I know what I'm doing and I know how to reassemble them properly, and I just, you know, kind of take that risk into my own hands. If you are taking pens apart in the proper way and putting them back together in the proper way, um, you're really not going to have any long-term problems because you're doing it properly. Uh, it's where, you know, if you're if you're reassembling a nib into a pen and you you thought that you could just put the nib in any which way, but in fact it has to go in a certain way, and you put it in wrong, and it gets stuck or it's cracked or the nib bends. You know, maybe it puts undue stress on the uh, on the housing, or maybe it doesn't go in quite all the way, and the nib ends up hitting the top of the cap, and it bends. And you know, there's all kinds of things that can happen. And I believe me, we have seen it it all. We've basically seen everything that you could possibly imagine happen to a pen. Um, you would be surprised. Uh, and as a retailer, it's, I'm in an interesting place because I get to see it from the manufacturer's standpoint and their point of view, and I get to see it from your point of view as a, as a consumer, so to speak, or the end user of the pen. Um, and, you know, sometimes there can be a little bit of finger pointing of the manufacturer says, well, they're clearly, you know, not using this pen in a normal way. There's no way we're going to be able to cover that. And, you know, the end user might say, well, I'm just using my pen. It's my pen. I can use it however I want. You should cover it. The pen should just work. And that's when things can get a little interesting is when there is a difference of opinion about that. Um, and I think that generally speaking, nib removal or any sort of like nib, well, really anything kind of to do with the nib can get into a really sticky spot if there's a problem. Now, if you've been using a pen for a long time, you've removed it a whole bunch of times, and then all of a sudden it starts to write scratchy, a manufacturer would say, well, it didn't come to you writing scratchy. Something happened to it. And they would say, like, look, if you're uninstalling and reinstalling it and it becomes scratchy, there's probably something that happened in the point of you reinstalling it that made it scratchy. We sent it out to you with it not scratchy. You know, it doesn't just get scratchy on its own. Something probably happened to it. And that would maybe not be covered. You know, whereas if you are... Um, you know, if you're, if you're taking out the pen, taking out the nib and cleaning under normal use and writing with it, and then all of a sudden the, the cap threads break in normal capping and stuff like that, that has nothing to do with the fact that you've ever disassembled the nib. That's a completely different part of the pen. So it's not like if you're ever taking the pen apart, the whole thing is war warranty void and null and none of that's any good. You know, certainly a, a pen company that's like really, really particular, uh, I'm not gonna name any specific ones. There are, there are brands that I don't carry that are known for being incredibly particular about their warranty stuff and they will charge you a lot of money to fix their things if there's ever anything that's um, even hints at it not being uh, anything that they did um, so it gets to a, it gets to a sticky spot um, there so uh, I would say you know generally speaking it's probably safer to assume that if you're taking a pen apart to that degree for cleaning or something like that you're probably getting to a place where you may have to um, take your warranty into your own hands. So really just take that extra care and use that uh, caution uh, wisely uh, and, and all that. But, you know, other brands, you know, Noodlers and Twisby, they like include instructions and wrenches on how to take apart things, you know? So it's like, it's gonna be different for every company. Uh, and uh, it's, it's something that um, is not going to be a hard, fast rule for everybody, but 
chances are it's going to leave more on the side of, of um, voiding the warranty. Now, uh, the thing I will say it, to kind of back up what I'm saying here, um, most manufacturers just do not test their pens with the majority of inks that are out there in the world today. Easily, I would say there's probably 1,500 to 2,000 different ink colors among a lot of different brands, and there's largely a lot of them probably that are handmade and smaller and only made in certain countries that are never exported that, that I'm not even aware of. Um, so it's possible there could be more than 2,000. Uh, there's no way that every pen company can test every new pen they come out with with 2,000 different colors of ink. Um, so there could be properties of ink that, that do make it more of a necessity to completely disassemble your pen uh, for cleaning, but I think most manufacturers would tend to fall into the camp of, well, you're using an ink that maybe isn't kind of part of what we would consider to be normal use. Uh, and that is something that has been kind of a great debate within the pen community is which inks are safe or not for various pens and um, I think it's much more common these days to have boutique ink brands that are making very saturated uh, dye based inks using things like shimmering stuff, high sheening things that can be higher maintenance, can stress some of the flow properties of certain pens, some of how easy they are to clean, where it can very legitimately be a necessity to disassemble a pen to clean, say, a shimmering ink out of your pen fully, uh, but the manufacturer probably would be able to back up their case to say, well, a shimmering ink isn't something that we would recommend you use under normal use in our warranty type situation. Um, and that's something you can always ask a given manufacturer if you want to reach out to them. You can, you can ask us as a retailer. Sometimes we don't have clarity on those things coming from the manufacturer, but we can always try to get that clarity and ask. Um, you know, we can't, we can't, you know, plaster every specific detail of thing that's covered under every warranty for every pen, but we are very happy to try to find out if you have specific questions. Um, you know, if you absolutely love using a certain shimmering ink and you want to use it in a certain pen, uh, we can get you some details on, on how that works. Um, but most pen companies, especially major pen companies that have their own ink line, they'll say, in order to be completely safe, you should really stick to our inks or inks that are like them uh, for you know proper warranty of the pen. Some some companies may even go so far as to say you should only use our inks in your pens, uh, otherwise the warranty is void. And they say that really just kind of as a protective thing because they they don't even bother to to try to address um, other inks that are out there in the marketplace. They just say. We know we've tested what we make and that's it. Anything else is on you, which, hey, look, that's, that's totally up to the manufacturer what they want to do. But most manufacturers are fairly reasonable and they kind of understand that people are using different things. It's really only, it's really only if you run into some real issues uh, that, that it can get kind of sticky. Um, but that is life, right? It's kind of like if you take like aftermarket parts and put it on your car manufacturer might not want to warranty that and you know particular aspect of the car anymore um, because it has been uh, you know deviated from what they intended it to be uh, or if you're driving it you know if you're racing it all the time and you're putting it through really extreme things they're gonna say well that's this isn't what this car is for uh, you're using it in a more extreme way um, certainly a, a pen company could make make a use for that um, so I know I don't have like the perfect greatest answer for you. My thing would be, look, it's your pen. Use it however you want. Um, if you're doing any, certainly if you're doing any grinding or alteration of the nib, that's very obvious. You've vo voided, voided the warranty on that. If you're just removing it and putting it back, if, if through that process you cause a problem, then you've voided the warranty of that pen because you've done something to that pen that was not a normal function of it and you've caused that to happen. If you're removing it and all that kind of stuff and something completely unrelated happens and is a problem, then that should be something, you know, and you and you know that to be true, then, then the, the manufacturer should still back it up. But it's going to vary. All right. Corey, or sorry, Cody M on Facebook says, 
Is there a no longer manufactured pen that you do not own but wish you did? And what makes it special? I think I've alluded to this in the past, but I can't remember exactly when. Um, my easiest answer would be my own original wooden pens that I made back in the day. Uh, the, some of the first Goulet pens. I loved exotic woods. That's what got me into pens in the first place. Um, but I don't have, I have like, I think one, maybe just a couple. Most of the pens I still have are complete defects or rejects or just the worst of the worst that no one ever wanted to buy. So I was left with them. Uh, I do have, I think, one or maybe two pens that aren't defective uh, that I actually essentially ended up reacquiring over time through like my, one of them, my sister-in-law, I had gifted it to her. And, and after a long time, I was like, hey, I, I actually don't have any of my pens. Can I get that back from you? <laughs> you know, we worked out. She was super cool about it, but I was like, I literally don't have a good pen from one I made back in the day. Can I keep this one as an example for historical sake? And she was cool about that. So uh, other than that, like there's a lot of wooden Brian Goulet made pens out there and a very select few Rachel Goulet made pens um, that are floating out there in the world and uh, those would be very sentimental to me really and that's about it as functional as pens they're not as good as you know a lot of other pens that I have now um, you know but uh, having something that's not just like a bunch of duds and rejects would be nice to, to keep for my own reference because um, this was the early days of the business we had no money and we had to sell everything that was sellable because we had no cash um, apart from that, so that's I'm gonna that's sort of a halfway answer. I'm gonna set that aside and not really say that's my real answer. Um, for me, I think the com as far as commercial made pens go, um, the Omos 360 is probably one of the ones that I really, you know, kind of missed out on. Um, it was uh, it was a pen that was I was I was very much aware of. We we um, became an Omos retailer like the last year that Omos was in business. So we were excited about the opportunities. We had no idea that they were going to, to go under. Um, and I was, I was pining for a 360, uh, but I wanted, to, I wanted to, to sell a 360. I wanted to come out with it, and then and the first one we got in, I was going to take it. Um, but we never, excuse me, we never uh, were able to sell the 360 because it was basically they had, they pretty much stopped making them uh, by the time that we were carrying them. Some of the retailers still had them, but we acquired the brand. We had the, the Ogiva model. We had the, um, the Arte Italiana, uh, and that was pretty much it. We had just a couple of models, uh, a couple of colors of pens, and then they went under and, and, and disappeared into oblivion. Uh, that was, you know, five years ago or so, and uh, it's not coming back. So there are some, you know, uh, 360s floating around out there. And, and what makes them special, aside from the fact that, you know, there's that little kind of just sentimental element to it that um, it was a pen I was hoping to, you know, just kind of like in the stage of, you know, Rachel and I started in the garage. I was making my own pens. We sold paper and ink only for the first year, and then we got platinum preppies and noodler's pens, and it was like, it was sort of milestones for us to either acquire certain brands as a retailer or be able to sell a certain level of pen. Like, you know, we started out with very inexpensive pens and we've been able to carry more and more prestigious pens as we've developed a reputation and, and um, been able to serve customers who are, you know, discerning with these uh, certain pen tastes. Um, so for us, it's been, that's been part of it. And, and that, you know, Omos was kind of a, a breakthrough uh, brand for us at a time when we uh, really didn't have a lot of luxury, you know, pens. Um, and it's, you know, it's still only a, a part of what we do. Believe me, we love, we love all pens, right? Um, but to, to, to have pens like that out of reach for us as a retailer and then to kind of build ourselves up to the point where we had the reputation to be able to carry them, there was, there was something to that just from like a, a business standpoint, um, a personal standpoint within the business. Um, it was kind of a milestone. So that was one pen that I kind of just had in mind of like, hey, this would be, this would be kind of a cool iconic pen to be able to, to sell. Uh, never got there though. So Omos went away and, and so on. And you know, of course then that led us to Visconti and Namiki and some other, some other really interesting projects. Um, but uh, there you go. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's like now at the point they're, they're not around anymore to get one is like a thousand bucks. Um, you know, and it's just, uh, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's something that I, it's kind of in my past almost. I don't know if I'm going to like save up and get a 360 or something like that. I've been offered a, a few over the years that have been, you know, not like great deals, but they've been decent enough pens. Um, 
it's something that you know it's it's tough for me because that that starts to fall into a category of like you know vintage even though it's not that old you know vintage stuff stuff that's not made anymore stuff you can't get anymore to me i almost have to kind of cut myself off a little bit because i have such a pen collection at this point that i have to draw a line somewhere and getting into um you know modern pens obviously you know serve well because that's what we sell and that's what i know and i can talk about them um, but um, for me to get into vintage is like i'm like really falling off the, the, the deep end there um, so yeah, that would be it. Uh, the 360, it was really cool because if you're not familiar with the 360, I don't have one to show you, I apologize, but, um, it was a triangular pen. So a triangular grip, the whole pen was triangular, it was a piston mechanism. They made a lot of demonstrator versions, they had a lot of celluloid versions. Um, the, the Omas Arco celluloid is, is kind of iconic. Um, they did a couple of different colors of the celluloids there. Um, they had a magnum size, which was a bigger one, which was really great. I'm not sure if they ever made an actually magnum size in that Arco, um, but I guess if I could dream one up, that would be um, that would be my dream there. So yeah, there that would probably be that would be my, probably be my answer to that. All right, I got a couple ink questions. One's from Alexandra K on Facebook. I've got an ink which is too light for my taste, Jerobon Diablement. I love the color. How can I make this ink more saturated? Is it okay to add different ink with similar color from a different brand like Kaweco Paradise Blue? Uh, lightening up an ink is a little easier than darkening it. Um, so I will say that, you know, if you want to lighten it, you basically add distilled water um, or like a dilution liquid, like Diatromenus has a dilution liquid um, for their uh, document inks and uh, a couple other brands, you know, have them, like uh, Penider has it in there. Um, uh, ink mixing kits as well as uh, platinum has it in the mix free and there's a couple others out there but um, you know lightening it up is, is much more straightforward darkening it is a lot tougher um, because you are removing some of the um, you know basically wetting agents from it. it's going to change the it's going to change the color but it's also going to change some of the properties and there's no there's no real super easy way to do that um, like you mentioned you know you could mix a darker ink into it um, if you're crossing brands like that, you know, you don't necessarily know what's in there. I mean, some brands are fairly similar to each other. Others are maybe not. Um, so you want to be really careful when you're doing that. Um, obviously, if you come across anybody who has a recipe that they've tested and stuff like that, that's pretty reliable. Um, but, I mean, when you get into ink mixing, you're kind of in Wild West territory a little bit, unless you find somebody who's like really an ink mixing enthusiast. Um, but if you're crossing brands, it's best to mix just a little bit of ink at a time, mix it in like a small sample vial, and then let it sit for several hours, maybe a day or so, uh, and then ink it up in a pen that you maybe don't care about as much. Because uh, really you want to make sure you're not going to have any like weird uh, clumping or foaming or gelling effects that happens, uh, because sometimes you can get some reactions with certain uh, properties that are in the ink. I don't know what is in some of these inks that cause them to do that. Uh, in particular, like Noodler's Base State inks, you do not want to mix those with non-Base State inks unless you want to see some cool reaction, but you don't want to put it in a pen. Um, so that one I know is for sure one example of one. Um, others you can kind of experiment with. I've heard a lot of people have mixed all different kinds of inks uh, with good success. So it's, it's certainly something you can do. Um, I just can't say like for certain, yeah, do this, it's no problem. You just want to be, you want to be intentional about how you do it. Um, so that is that is definitely one way to do it. Another way it's, uh, you know, something you could experiment with, maybe just on a small volume. Um, so if you think about, like, um, uh, if you add water, uh, you know, or a dilution liquid or something to an ink, uh, that will make it lighter, right, and desaturate it. Um, so what is the opposite of that, right? So if you want to darken up an ink, you can take water out of it. So that's a little less straightforward of a process, not as precise, but essentially you just open it up and leave it out and let the water evaporate. Um, so it's very hard to do that precisely, um, but essentially that's the process if you want to darken up an ink without having to mix it or anything like that. I've never really heard of anybody doing it uh, repeatably uh, and, and with ease, uh, but certainly you could experiment with it if you hate the color and you just want it to be different and, you know, throw a couple mill milliliters in a sample vial and leave it out for a bit. Maybe as you're like just kind of working at home or something like that and you can check on it on a pretty regular basis. If you have it in something like a sample vial that has like notches on it as to how much is evaporated, you know, maybe just make a small line on it and, and try and measure out like about where 10% would be or 15 or 20% or whatever. And then kind of see the notches as it goes down. And then you can see, okay, I've had some water evaporate out of there and I can, uh, I can test out the ink now and you can try it in, in a couple different ways. So, um, 
that is a something I'm recommending to you. I've never really heard of anybody actually doing that. But theoretically, uh, you could do that, and that would darken up your ink. So that is one way that I have to do it. Um, you know, you can't just like mix like a black ink or something and darken it up a little bit. That's going to severely change the color. If you do mix an ink, you're going to need to do something that's kind of in the similar color family, so it won't shift the dyes too much. Uh, but there you go. So good luck. <laughs> All right, Hayden Hund on Twitter. What kind of ink do you think looks best inside a demonstrator like the VAC 700R Twisby? Uh, shimmer and non-shimmer. Okay, so uh, it's actually kind of interesting because when you get into looking at uh, ink inside of a pen, like you have in a demonstrator pen, like these Twisbys, uh, you know, if you have a really dark ink like this, like this is a dark purple in here, when the ink is just sitting in there, I actually really can't tell that it's purple. It just looks black. When you have a, a dark ink, blues, purples, blacks, even greens, browns, all that, really unless you're seeing the ink that's kind of clinging to the walls uh, where you can see a lot of light through it, that's really the only time you can really see color. So it's almost kind of counterintuitive because if you want a really cool ink effect that has a lot of color and vibrancy to it, you go with something really deep and saturated uh, on paper. Uh, so you go with something deep and saturated in your pen to write on paper and it looks looks more vibrant and colorful on the page. It's the actually the opposite when you have ink sloshing around inside a pen. So you actually want something lighter in color, lesser saturated, so that more light can pass through it and you can see more of that color. So like this red here, this is, I grabbed this off Rachel's desk. I don't know what ink this is, uh, but um, that's the general concept is the lighter the ink, the more it's kind of coating the inside of the pen, the more you're actually gonna see the color of the ink inside the pen, like this one. Whereas other pens you might have, like I've got a dark blue inside my Twisby here, and it, okay, that works out pretty well. Um, so uh, when I get into like which ink specifically looks good, it's 100% subjective. Um, my general opinion is that the lighter in color and the more vibrant in color, <coughs> the better it's gonna look inside a pen. I think you know, generally speaking, people like the appeal of when a color matches something else on the pen. So if you have a completely clear demonstrator like this Twisby Eco Clear, you can put whatever you want in here because the ink is going to be the only coloration that you see in here, except for, of course, the red finial on the top. Um, if you have a pen with, like, red accents like this or, you know, turquoise accents or purple accents, uh, then if you match the color of the ink, to the trim of the pen, such as Rachel has done on all three of these pens that I took off her desk, um, <laughs> these are going to look pretty cool, right? Because the ink color sloshing around in there matches the pen. I honestly think this is part of the reason why people like to match the ink with their pen is because of the way that it looks in the pen, not just the way that it looks on the paper. Though I'm sure there's a good combination of both and it's probably different for everybody. Um, you know, but if you have a clear pen or something like with like a gray, like I have this, um, you know, 580 ALR, um, that I've got a blue in, like that works because whatever, it's a neutral, neutral color pen so I can put whatever color I want. You could also go the route of, you know, complementing. So say you had a purple pen and you wanted to put turquoise ink in here. Purple and turquoise go well together um, and you can have something that looks really nice um, there that is not necessarily the same color as what's in the pen, but it is taken into account. Um, so that said, um, I do think that shimmering inks look really cool inside pens. Um, the one pen that I have inked up here with a shimmering ink is in my Twisby Go, which is a demonstrator, but you don't necessarily see the shimmer quite as much because it's got these threads right here. But I have Kyanite Du Nepal, um, the new Urban 1798 color in there, which does look great. So that's a really good shimmering color. Basically any lighter shimmering color that has a lot of shimmer in it is going to look pretty awesome. Um, Emerald Chavor looks pretty darn good. Um, Diamond Golden Sands, I really like that. It's a, it's a you know goldish color. Diamond Pink Glitz looks pretty rad. Um, any like the Robert Oster Shake and Shimmies, those are just dumped with, with shimmer, like uh, Blue Moon, Envy, just to name a few there. Um, high sheening inks, I want to talk about those. You didn't ask about them, but I'm going to talk about them. Um, they actually don't make any difference, really, that I can tell inside a pen, because you really only get that sheen effect. Uh, when the ink is dry. So it might make the feed look really cool uh, and very sheeny, but sloshing around inside a pen doesn't really seem to matter in terms of how much sheen uh, a pen has. 
Um, but if you have pens that, uh, sorry, if you have inks that, are, that have really high shading properties, those are probably going to look good in a pen because those tend to be maybe a little less saturated than some others. So some conventional inks that are non-shimmer that I think that I just whatever my opinion is worth uh, that I think look good in a pen. Noodler's Apache Sunset looks pretty cool. Uh, Diamine Marine, I just I like that turquoise. Um, Pilot Rocha Zuku Murasaki Shikibu is a really nice purple color. Uh, Diamine Apple Glory, you know, green color. Um, yeah, these are just to name a few, but largely it's more a matter of like principle and approach towards what inks might look good inside a pen. Uh, one other thing I kind of wanted to mention is that um, one thing that can, can have an impact is like the, I don't know, I'll call it the, the stickiness of an ink to the side of a pen. That can look really cool. Like part of the reason this red looks really good is because it's, it's kind of sticking more to the sides and you see the color more than in my blue where it just kind of like plop. I mean, it, it'll stick a little bit. That's actually not so bad, but it's sticking to like half of it. So depending on the angle you're looking at, um, it can maybe look pretty cool. Um, I've got this, uh, um, you know, Noodler's, sorry, not Noodler's, pff, wow. Uh, Visconti London Fog. Um, the blue looks really cool. It matches the, you know, the ribbons and stuff inside the pen, but it doesn't really stick a whole lot to the sides of the pen. So it sticks there for like two seconds and then it just largely looks black. So this one is maybe not one to show off necessarily, but that's okay. I, I wanted to see the ribbons and stuff like that. I didn't want it to compete too much. Um, so I can see it sloshing back and forth, but it's not like coating the inside. Whereas you get an ink like Noodler's Bay State Blue that like coats the inside of the pen. Um, and that's kind of its own special deal anyway, because that ink is unique. Um, but that's one example of the effect you can get just in the coating properties. And the reason I can't, go too specifically into that is because that is going to vary not just by the ink color um, and it's not even like one brand sticks and one doesn't it's literally like color by color it has to do with the dye properties and various things it's literally like even within one brand one can just immediately run off the sides of the pen another one will stick for forever um, and it just really varies I have no real idea why and it's completely random and sometimes it's different on different types of resin too. So depending on the type of plastic it is, depending on what other stuff may be going on, if there's like, this is a piston filling pen, so it's got some silicone grease on here, it could be sticking more to the silicone grease. There's too many factors for me to reliably say like, this ink, that ink, this ink, that ink will always look better. And the truth is, is you're gonna have to experiment and really see. So that could be a good opportunity for those of you in the comments who have a lot of experience with such things inks that look good in certain demonstrator pens. Honestly, me personally, I had to think about this a little bit and that's why I wanted to talk about it in Q&A because it always prompts me to think. Um, the way that an ink looks in a pen is like 5% of a factor for me for how I'm gonna ink up a pen. Whereas other people's, it's like 95%. Um, you know, so for me, it's, it's just not the biggest deal to me. I think it's kind of interesting and cool, but I'm also like the kind of person where you know, I notice that someone is wearing the same color shoes that match their shirt or accessories or whatever. And I'm like, oh, wow, wow, that's really interesting how it worked out like that. And they're like, well, yeah, I chose it that way. And I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Like, it's just not, it's not something that's top of mind for me, which is probably why I wear things like trans Siberian Orchestra t-shirts while you Q&A. Just the aesthetics are not, you know, natural to me like they would be to some others, but, uh, hopefully this can at least guide you uh, towards an approach for your own ink selection for your pens. Cool? All right, I'm going to close out this week with a business question from Brad the Bear one on Instagram. How much money does it cost for a large-scale pen maker like Pilot or Lamy to design a new pen? This is a very interesting question. Um, it's going to depend a lot on the company and the specific pen. I will blanket disclaimer this whole question to say that I'm not privy to any information about the costs uh, for developing basically any pen from any manufacturer. Um, some of them, especially if they're smaller and it overlaps more with my own pen making experience from the past and what I understand, I can um, you know make some reasonable uh, estimations as to what it could cost. Um, but a large scale pen maker, it's honestly more complex than, than I can even wrap my head around. 
Um, so I'm not going to get into specific numbers because I'm going to get out of my depth so fast. Uh, and I'm not going to do anybody any service by just randomly guessing. Um, but, you know, to my understanding, it's, it's larger companies like these that essentially have like R&D departments, right? Like I know Lamy does. They have a whole building on their premises for engineering, um, like literally like making the molds and stuff like engineering the molds for their machines to make their pens. So like they're literally making the machines to make their pens. And they've got to engineer that. They've got to pay for the building, those engineers, the whole everything. They have a design team that are working. Like, I mean, Lamy said that they say they spend three to eight years designing a new pen model. I mean, how much are they paying before they even sold a pen, you know, for that? So R&D stuff, I have no idea. I have no idea. Like, how would I ever know? Um, unless they like put together a report and gave it to me, you know, and why would they do that? <laughs> you know, I'm sure certain people, even within companies like Lamy or Pilot or Sailor or whoever it might be, Mont Blanc, you know, I'm sure they only keep that kind of compiled information, you know, for themselves. But anyway, I digress. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, Pilot, for example, it's got such a wide range of pens. You know, think about developing a new, you know, Namiki Emperor design is going to be completely different than coming out with a pen like the Pilot Metropolitan when they came out with it for the first time, you know, six or seven years ago. Um, you know, these mass-produced versus, uh, you know, extremely, you know, high artisanal products, it's going to be completely different. So um, I really don't have a clue. It's probably way more than you think <laughs> to develop these pens, way more. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I think that's why a lot of companies will you know, kind of space out coming up with completely new pen model designs or why you'll see the same nib and housing section or the same piston mechanism or the same, you know, specific, you know, accents of a pen that will be largely similar and they'll change up smaller elements of it. Like they'll change some more of the design accents like center bands and, and clips and some of these other things, the, the things that are more like, you know, uh, it, accessories or trim, uh, they might change those a little more than like completely designing a pen from scratch because the costs are just going to be so much higher. They're going to have to sell, um, you know, way more pens or spread it out over a long period of time to recoup those R&D costs. Um, so, you know, just some, as I was kind of thinking through some of the things that are going to, uh, sorry, no, no, let me complete my thought. So yes, coming up with a whole new pen model is going to be very expensive, um, which is why, you know, like Aurora, for example, with this Oceani new pen model, you know, it's got the same nib unit and everything, very similar grip, same ink window piston mechanism and stuff like that. So it's largely form factor and some other accents and, and other trim and materials and stuff like that that have changed. But it's, you know, it's going to have a very similar feel to an 88 or an Optima, right? Because the general other things going on are going to be somewhat similar. Um, and uh, it's still going to be a higher cost because there are definitely engineering and design related things to that that they have frankly just fewer pens to spread that over to recoup that cost um, which is why a lot of times limited editions cost more it's not because they're just trying to gouge everybody but it's because they have fewer pens to spread out all of their costs on um, and so they try to make it um, to make it more interesting to, to make it worthwhile for you all um, but um, I think that's the reason why you see you know, popular pen models that come out with lots of new colors in a series, right? Like, you know, um, Visconti with their Homo sapiens. So the Homo sapiens is incredibly innovative, very interesting design. And they come out with different trim, different accents, different limited edition, you know, out of the resins and stuff like that. They'll come out with on a fairly regular basis because they're not having to completely redesign everything. They're able to come out with, um, you know, these special uh, versions of it because it doesn't require an entire redesign from the ground up. Um, so some of the things just that I was thinking about when I was thinking about what would it, what does it take for a large scale um, manufacturer to actually be able to design a new pen? Just really trying to think through the whole process and I'm probably largely leaving things out too, but um, designing a pen from scratch, there's like market research aspects of it. Um, there's artists, designers, engineers, you know, programmers, because a lot of times you have machines that have to be done, so you got to have programming, prototyping, maybe even outside collaborators or designers, like Lamy often collaborates with other people outside of even the pen world with some of their pens, so they've got to obviously have some kind of agreement with them, and there's money that's got to be involved there. 
um, custom tooling and equipment, packaging as well, um, branding, marketing, they gotta come up with a name, they've gotta you know, do all that, like even just like trademarking and copyright research when they come out with a new pen model name, especially if it's a large scale global manufacturer, um, they gotta make sure that they're not violating anyone else's trademark when they come up with a new name model. Honestly, um, you know, if you think about it, it's like um, uh, one example of this is for with Pilot, um, their their pen in Japan is known as the Pilot Elite, and here it's known as the E95S, same pen. Why is it called the E95S in the U.S., but the Elite in Japan? Well, it's because I believe it's Parker uh, has a trademark on the name Elite on a pen in the U.S., so they can't call it that without violating, uh, I, yeah, I'm assuming it's I think I heard that as Parker, I, well, I'm, I'm not a trademark lawyer, I haven't done all the full research on that, but you know, obviously it's the same kind of thing. If there is another trademark that has happened um, with, with anybody else, it doesn't even have to be a pen company, it could be somebody else could have a trademark on writing instruments or something like that, uh, and the name has to be different. You know, for, so for a large scale manufacturer like that, you might end up with a couple different versions or variations or names or, you know, if there's a, a, a patent or something that's on a specific element of a pen um, in one country, uh, they might not be able to sell it in that country or they have to tweak it or they have to do whatever, you know, so it gets really interesting. So there's, somebody's got to research all that and somebody's got to make sure to pay the lawyers to do all that. Um, there's advertising and promotion once, you know, these pens need to get known about and, and talked about. There's like barcoding and UPC registration, and there's all this like operational stuff behind the scenes that's got to happen. Um, and then obviously, if a company is like already making stuff and they're adding on new pen models, um, unless they're also taking stuff away, they may have to expand their factory, have additional capacity, additional machines, you know, warehouse space, forklifts, and you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. Hiring people, you know. So there's there's distribution logistics and all that. There's so much to add. Um, a new pen for worldwide distribution. Um, it's probably just way more expensive than we realize. Um, it's a significant investment of time, money, focus, resources uh, for companies to be able to do that. That's why you're not seeing, you know, completely new models from large scale manufacturers every six months, you know, because it's a very involved process in doing so. So, without being able to give you specific numbers, uh, hopefully I was at least able to, to prompt and make the, an interesting answer to the question. So, very extended Q&A today. I apologize for making that so long. The long intro didn't help, but hopefully I showed you some cool pen stuff. Um, there you go. That's it for this week. I hope you all have a fantastic weekend or week or whenever you happen to be watching this. Before you go, though, my question of the week for you is what is your pen that got away? Um, or something that maybe you wish you'd bought when you had the opportunity, but now it's either not available anymore, or it's outside of your budget, or you've moved on, or whatever, but that you still kind of think about like, dang, if only I'd gotten that when I had the chance. So for me, you know, kind of that Omos 360 falls into that, that category, but, or maybe my own wooden pens. Um, but I'm curious what that is for you. Just go ahead and leave uh, something in the comments there. Uh, we'd love, love to know what's on your mind. Uh, be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Love when you all engage with us here. Um, thank you so much. Be sure to check out a lot of what we talked about here on GoodlyPens.com because we are a retail store if you're not quite aware of that. Um, anyway, thank you. I hope you have a great rest of your weekend.